So we can just start off talking about, obviously I think a lot of, there's been a lot of media coverage on the epidemic um, and Taiwan's success during it. Uh, and I want to ask you about just some of the successes and then we can move on to the challenges as well. Sure. So successes, uh, I think one of the things that uh, really struck me, uh, stuck out at me, was the rumor over what was it? Your humor, humor over, over rumor. Excuse yes. me. <laughs> it's fine. So uh, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that idea, how mm -hmm. that idea originated within the government, sure. um, how often you guys are using it, right? Mm -hmm. Because aside from that, you know, Premier Su wiggling mm -hmm. his butt photo. Like, and also the Q spokes dog. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, oh, the and, chai, which is very humorous. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about those. Are those things still mm -hmm. ongoing? Yeah, of course. Or we're doing mm -hmm. this every day? Like yeah, Zong, Zong Chai is, of course, alive and well. I mean, <laughs> Zong oh, it's a real dog. It, it, it's a real dog that okay. lives with the participation officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Okay. And the PO uh, lives just, um, I think, a few minutes walk from the MOHW. Okay. So they can just walk back home after okay. each CECC press conference and take new pictures of the dog okay. without paying Shutterstock or anything like that. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and then begin new, new memes about it. Okay. Yeah, um, the, the idea of humor over rumor uh, was introduced, I think, around 2017. Uh, I proposed that idea in a cabinet meeting, mm -hmm. uh, saying that there needs to be a fast, a public and a structural response that makes clarifications more viral uh, than disinformation. And I drew this experience from my own participation in the 2014 Sunflower Movement, mm -hmm. where we did set up, uh, the, for example, live streaming to the streets mm -hmm. so that uh, this information about the Occupy itself uh, will not grow because everybody who walk by the street can check for themselves what's actually going on in the Occupy Parliament. Uh, so uh, that's a solution to a issue that often plagued Occupy movements, which is rampant mm -hmm. disinformation and conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that has some personal experience, I guess, in it. And also around that time, 2017, uh, one colleague uh, in my office, uh, the name is Chen Yan Yeo, um, who actually wanted a job at NIDAC, uh, but I, I don't think he actually get, got it, but uh, he uh, is very proficient in the use of memes uh, yeah. and uh, has actually quite a following. But anyway, okay. anyway uh, so, um, so he also shared with all the participation officers at the time mm -hmm. about the idea of uh, using memes to overcome rumors mm -hmm. uh, and also shared many international um, like counterparts uh, doing uh, similar things. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, there's a uh, Betia Reykjavik uh, platform, uh, literally built by the party in Iceland that's called the best party. Okay. right? Uh, and so there's uh, like political movements all around the world mm. uh, that has this kind of co comedic um, idea uh, to it. Mm. And even uh, domestically in Taiwan uh, since last year, we also have a political party. The name is literally Can't Stop This Party. <laughs> uh, right, or, or the unstoppable happy party, right? Uh, and they do have a Taipei city councillor, so it's, it's a real party. Uh, and, <laughs> and many of the party members are prominent YouTubers and so on. So they mm -hmm. are also working on humor over rumor. So it's not just the, the state or the public sector. The, yeah. the people, the social sector is also working on pretty much the same idea. Um, and so, uh, but uh, to be frank, uh, back in 2017, um, the participation officers um, uptake of these ideas were kind of lukewarm. Uh, there are some notable uh, examples like the National Palace Museum, but by and large, uh, people do not think that the rumors are that much a problem that we need to work with professional convenience uh, to, to tackle. Uh, but fast forward um, to the 2018 election, where disinformation was really rampant uh, because the election was coupled with the referenda, and the referenda tend to you know, uh, travel out outrage, uh, which makes the disinformation even more easy to spread. Uh, and so that became like a real problem. Uh, and so then, uh, of course, the new uh, spokesperson at the time, Gulasio Daka, uh, really liked the idea. And it was her uh, who actually implemented the triple two system, uh, where um, when all the disinformation, trending disinformation gets detected, the relevant competent authority, usually a ministry, need to come up with two pictures, each 200 words or less, uh, that uh, gets the uh, clarification message viral within two hours. So that's the triple two principle. So the, the main implementer is Gulasio Daka. 
So two pictures, two hundred words. What's what's the other two? Uh, within two hours. Within two hours. Yeah, the the same news cycle. To be precise, two hundred characters. Yeah.、Mm. Oh, okay.、Mm -hmm. Right, because we're talking in Chinese.、Mm -hmm. Um, and so, since that minister, sorry, was it a minister? The think, spokesperson. Since that spokesperson took it、yeah. up, um, is that when you guys started hiring? Professional comedians、mm -hmm. within the so because it's delegated to the ministries,、mm. right? So the ministries did、uh, right start、uh, working with professional comedians,、mm -hmm. uh, and the、uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare is an interesting case、uh, mm -hmm. because the participation officer themselves、uh, is actually、uh, quite a professional、uh, in making such uh, interesting uh, memes,、um, and so instead of、uh, like working with、uh, contractors or working with、uh, professionals,、uh, the、uh, PO uh, themselves、um, can suggest, for example, the famous Pink Musk、uh, episode. It was、mm -hmm. them、uh, that suggested to Minister Chen Shizhong, "You should put on a pink mask to show solidarity to the boy who called." That says your rationale mask. Oh, I get this pink. I don't want to go to school.、Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it was also the PO who suggested、uh, that the Minister Chen should say that his childhood idol was the Pink Panther.、Uh, and so, th this is like really humorous take、uh, on not only gender mainstreaming but also making. Mask a, a fashionable item、uh, that people would like not only、uh, wear it for health、uh, purposes but also wear it for like just making a statement. Yeah, yeah. I see a rainbow mask. That, that's right. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the rainbow mask. I saw a lot of rainbow masks、yes. during Pride as well.、Uh -huh. um, okay. What What are some of the I guess other successes that、mm -hmm. you are really proud of、um, during this pandemic? Um, that Taiwan has achieved,、um, mm -hmm. especially. In the digital realm,、mm -hmm, sure.、Uh, so the digital realm is the assistive、uh, role. The most important technologies are、uh, chemical, that's to say, soap and hand sanitizers, <laughs> and and physical, which is masks, respectively.、Uh, so digital may be a third <laughs>、uh, assistive technology. So、um, I think one of the main things that I want to stress is that、uh, during the pandemic, we limited the centralization of data collection, although by By the、um, authorizing act, the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center, has the um, lawful um, authorization to collect new data.、Um, by and large,、uh, we work with the heuristic that says we do not collect new data in the name of the pandemic that we were not already collecting before the pandemic. Uh, and this is very important because for each new data collection, there's a set of privacy and cybersecurity evaluation and impact assessment that must be done. And if this is、uh, like genuinely new, like、uh, the Bluetooth dongle for contact tracing、mm. that Singapore、uh, has rolled out, then of course people will take time to familiarize themselves with those cybersecurity and privacy parameters. And by essentially、uh, not doing that and piggybacking on existing data. Collection methods, for example, the national health card and the、uh, refillable uh, prescription. Uh, we use the same method to dispense the mask at the pharmacies. Or for the digital fence, we use the、uh, earthquake advance warning or flood advance warning, which builds on the、uh, cell phone tower signal strength triangulation. That's an existing data collection endpoint.、Uh, so、um, I think we avoid the needless、uh, invention of new data collection methods in the name of pandemic, and therefore、uh, the cyber security. And privacy parameters, although of course it's still debated and still controversial. At least people are talking apple to apple or orange to orange because we were not working with apple on that orange、um, versus orange on these data collection methods. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing that up because actually that was one of the main questions I wanted、mm -hmm. to ask you.、Um, yeah. I guess I have been reading a little bit about the data collection. Um, or trying to read about it,、uh, but I guess the people that、mm -hmm. I spoke with,、mm -hmm. I spoke with a Gov Zero person,、sure. um, and then、uh, I also spoke with、um, a tech policy person.、Mm -hmm. I think you you probably know both. Yeah, of course I、uh, yeah. know both, and, and <laughs> because you have the policy of no anonymity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I read, of course, the,、uh, okay. the collaborative document. Okay,、yeah. so then yeah, can you talk to me a bit more? Because it seems like I mean, there are criticisms. Were interesting, right? They were、mm -hmm. saying, sure, from one perspective, from a technical perspective, you're saying what you're doing is piggybacking, but I'm not sure that I wasn't in Taiwan before, but I'm not sure that, say, the telecoms, they were collecting all this data, 
that in the past they weren't necessarily sending it to CCC, right? And no, they, they were they were not sending to CCC, but they were sending out earthquake warnings and flood warnings, mm. uh, depending on your phone's whereabouts, mm. right? So the CCC basically told them that they need to like add one more disaster type. Mm. Uh, to their uh, SMS sending, mm. and it is true that the earthquake warnings and flood warnings were only sent to people in the vicinity, mm. whereas for the digital funds, it's also sent to the medical officer because otherwise the medical officer cannot check your whereabouts, mm. right? So, so that is true. But so the data processing is done still by the telecoms. The data collection is the same, which is the phone signal data. The only difference is on the data application. Okay. And, and you mean so the application that's actually being used is being used by CECC? Uh, by the CECC mandated norms. That okay. is to say, send an SMS to the local medical officers uh, mm. if somebody breaks quarantine, mm. or send it to a police officer if somebody who is already a confirmed case mm. uh, breaks uh, the perimeter. Okay. Um, then I guess another question that arose, and I, I, I don't know which databases are being combined, right? But so I understand the CCC also gain access to, say, immigration databases. Mm -hmm. And then one of the other people I spoke with, um, what he told me was like that there were no, it wasn't really publicly stated how this data is being used, um, kind of the data operators. Um, what else? Uh, how long the data is going to be in use for. Um, you know, I'll, I guess there's a whole bevy of things that you can start worrying about once you start thinking about privacy. So of course. I would love to... You know, yeah, and, and that's a deficiency in our Privacy Act. Okay. Um, and a structural one. Uh, the only deficiency that prevents us from getting the GDPR adequacy uh, with the European Union, to be precise. Uh, and the reason is that Taiwan does not, at this moment, a single data protection authority, a, a single DPI. And there's no uh, independence uh, for the in institution that, for example, like the French CNIL, uh, which is an independent body uh, that plays the role of the DPA. And they get uh, basically public funding, uh, but uh, they don't report to any minister. At the moment, uh, the Taiwan Privacy Act says that each competent authority, each ministry, uh, is their own DPA, mm. as well as for the businesses that operates, for example, uh, that require a license, a permit uh, to operate under some ministry, then that ministry also becomes the DPA of those particular uh, businesses. Mm. But of course, in Taiwan, I mean, we're a liberal democracy most of the time, other than the health system, which is social democracy. We're a liberal democracy most of the time. Uh, and so uh, many businesses doesn't need a license for the competent authority. Mm. That also means that there is no enforcement if they violate the privacy uh, primitives. Um, and so uh, currently the interpreting um, agency for the um, data protection um, is the NDC, uh, specifically the data protection office within the National Development Council. Mm -hmm. But they are in charge for interpreting the law, but not enforcing the law. Mm. Each ministry is in charge of enforcing the law. And this federated uh, architecture essentially means we have maybe like 12 DPAs but we don't get 12 more seats at international table. So uh, that also means that uh, each DPA, uh, each ministry, is uh, free to enforce it however they want. And even for the same set of data, as you said, when the data sets are being joined together, if you ask one side or the other side, they may give different enforcement and interpretations and uh, definitely doesn't have the same, for example, data retention rules and things like that. So it is a problem. The criticism is valid. So can you tell me how, are you guys taking measures to address this? Oh, yeah, yeah, like within the next couple of weeks, actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, we are going to uh, propose to the legislature in a cabinet meeting sometime this month um, that we are going to establish an independent uh, privacy uh, protection um, agency, probably called a council or a commission. Uh, and this commission uh, reports only to the head of the cabinet. It doesn't report to any ministry. Its budget won't come from any ministry either. 
So that avoids the classic situation of a minister really wanting to do something, and then the person reporting under them uh, cannot uh, help stop them, basically. Uh, and so it would be like a truly independent. Uh, it's a little bit like the uh, Aviation Security uh, Council, uh, and actually it's been renamed to Transportation uh, Safety Council uh, in Taiwan. In that, it's an independent uh, agency. Mm -hmm. So we will propose that to the legislature, and with luck, the legislature will approve it uh, sometime next year. Uh, and so soon as it stops, um, you know, this decentralized DPA stuff, not only <clears throat> will probably get GDPR adequacy, but also this new DPA will be <clears throat> able to not only review, the, the NDC can already review, they are already reviewing, mm -hmm. but if they review and find something uh, wrong, uh, they don't have the enforcement power, but a new DPA will have enforcement power. You mean this new council? Uh, this happen. new council, something okay. like that, okay. yeah. When you say DPA, you mean... Uh, Data Protection Authority the, is a European Union term. Okay, yeah. sure. Um, will that... Will, will you... Okay, mm, two questions. Um, one, is that a personal proposal of mm -hmm. yours, or is mm -hmm. that just something that uh, I think a lot of people mm -hmm. around you, civic hackers, are... Mm -hmm something that you guys have ex had exchanges on, something that you think the community mm -hmm. wants. Um, and then two, is that gonna, are you guys gonna be able to retroactively kind of look back at some of the stuff that CECC has been doing mm -hmm. with data mm -hmm. in the, mm -hmm. since the pandemic has begun? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So to your first question, it's been deliberated on the V Taiwan platform. Um, I think it's uh, also in 2017 uh, from November. Uh, and uh, there is a draft of that uh, as early as 2018, uh, July 2018, from the NDC. Uh, so it's, it has been consulted, of course, uh, with stakeholders. But <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's my personal proposal. Uh, everybody see it as a shortcoming. It's just we need a politically opportune moment uh, to set up new agencies. And such an opportune moment um, came when Dr. Tsai Ing-wen promised that there will be a new digital competent authority um, as her second uh, presidential term uh, campaign promise. Um, actually, the vice president candidate of the KMT proposed pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> and so it's bipartisan, like by, by definition bipartisan. <clears throat> and so if you look at the legislature records, the KMT also worked on a data protection authority. Oh. So uh, once we have our version uh, from the uh, executive yuan, uh, that will be one of the versions uh, that legislature will deliberate alongside the KMT version. Mm. Um, so I would say that this is the moment where the two parties, uh, at least their uh, presidential and vice presidential candidates respectively, see this as the prior political priority to have a digital competent authority, before which uh, there's no like, wide bipartisan priority on this. And are you guys planning for it to be mostly informed by GDPR mm -hmm. and your uh, Of course, of course. And also the new Data Governance Act being deliberated by the EU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the first question. The second question, yeah, of course. Um, so right after SARS 1.0, actually in 2004, um, not only the administration, but the Constitutional Court uh, did a review of the actions taken during SARS 1.0 in 2003 mm -hmm. and found that this uh, lockdown, this barricading of entire hospital to be barely constitutional. That is to say, <clears throat> it would have been constitutional if people had thought about it, but because we did not have any experience with SARS. So the Constitutional Court said that it's barely constitutional, let's not do that again, and charge the legislature to make new rules and new legislation that will enable a constitutional, like, uh, well in advance, uh, like a fixed, like, 14 day, and so on. And instead of, like, just limiting people's freedom of movement uh, with no definite um, day, uh, we need to restrict this still very narrow and deep uh, privacy and freedom of movement violations, but uh, uh, with due process pre-approved by the legislature and people understand that after the 14 days of course there is no stigma uh, they, they can just freely move about so this is a joint review by not just the administrative branch but also the legislative and the judiciary and you think will there be one for I mean, after current after COVID-19? Um, assuming that there is a pause between SARS 2.0 and SARS 3.0, then we'll probably have time for this kind of review, hopefully.
are you predicting that Mars three point oh? I'm not predicting anything, but many people said that it is possible that it becomes something like a seasonal flu, because the base number is high enough for、uh, like mutations to to occur. So maybe not three point oh, but like. Two point one, two point two beta, or something like that, right? So, so if that happens, then the vaccination strategy, everything,、uh, needs to adapt as well, and will probably、uh, better off with the physical vaccines all the time,、uh, just to be sure. Because think、uh, about the possibility of、uh, SARS two point zero mutating, so that the fourteen days is no longer sufficient, and and that will change. Pretty much everything、uh, related to quarantine and things like that. So, assuming that no such mutations occur, we'll probably have some、uh, breathing room,、uh, literally, uh, to to、uh, have a retrospective, just as we did in two thousand four. Let's go back a little bit to. So, it seems like then if there's a bipartisan push for、mm-hmm. a data protection authority. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that arising? Do you think from the general public, like the Both political parties are sensing.、Mm-hmm. Oh, the general public actually has this desire for privacy.、Mm-hmm. Um, a, do you think that's happening in Taiwan? And、mm-hmm. I ask that question because working in Asia,、mm-hmm. a lot of times if you're writing data privacy stories, data protection stories, you know,、mm-hmm. um, the Western mindset、um, and kind of what scholars would say to you、mm-hmm. is the stereotype, right?、Mm-hmm. That Asians. Well, yeah, this whole、that. whole Confucianism thing. Yeah, so, yeah I, I don't know if it's Confucianism. I'm not up to date on Confucianism. Never studied it. So, but、mm-hmm. like you are a digital minister,、mm-hmm. so I want to get your take on this, especially because、mm-hmm. if we go back to what happened, talking about the data collection、mm-hmm. and、um, mm-hmm. it's okay. The narrative that has emerged from media is that in East Asian countries. The、citizens are willing to put up、mm-hmm. with a greater degree、mm-hmm. of surveillance. Yeah, Confucians.、Yes. Right, 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 right. <laughs>、yes. The South Korean、uh-huh. tra- contact tracing methods,、mm-hmm. Japan, Singapore. So I, I don't know.、Mm-hmm. Like, what, what is your take、yeah. on that? Okay, so first of all, I'm a Taoist. I'm not a competent authority on Confucianism.、Uh, but with that said,、uh, I do think Taiwan has something different here because uh, we uh, made sure that the data collection、uh, is. Piggybacking on existing data collection methodologies.、Uh, also, uh, we rely on what some media call participatory self-surveillance,、uh, meaning that instead of concentrating the data and therefore power、uh, to the CECC, independent business owners, for example, the hostess boss and host boss of the nightlife district, basically collect their own data on the patrons. But they can do so under a, for example, a pseudonym first basis, or a throwaway SIM card,、uh, or a throwaway email account,、um, in order for any reported case to be able to contact the patrons in the past couple of weeks.、Uh, but they do not need to hand over that data to the、uh, municipal or to the central. Government and in fact, these are shredded after a few weeks if there's no、uh, local cases, which has been like that for the past half a year. So、um, the idea is that the data collection, if it is balanced with the desire of pseudonymity or anonymity,、um, this actually gets more people participating. Otherwise, we're essentially driving. The nightlife、uh, district and uh, uh, workers there into underground, like the U.S. prohibition、uh, era, and then no good data <laughs> will, will come out of it. Actually, some nearby jurisdictions suffered、uh, from the second or third wave precisely because of this configuration,、uh, because they they forced the nightlife district to to comply using very top down methods. But here it is a、um, just a administrative. Um, um, Recommendation really, Xin Zheng Zhi Dao in in Mandarin,、mm-hmm. uh, and then they figure out their own way of retaining the data, but without the、um, uh, obligation to give the data to the CECC.、Um, and so I think this、um, means that they act out of. Rational self-interest, like keep the business going and not wanting to be stigmatized,、uh, and also、um, like our mask、uh, communication strategy is another example. We say wear a mask to protect yourself against your own unwashed hands. Again, this is a rational self-interest、uh, narrative. So I would say that during the pandemic, the narratives that comes out from Taiwan, especially from the CECC,、um, is a balance between collectivism and individualism, but it's mostly about rational self-interest. Mm-hmm. But do you think that 
Do you think it's generally true, though? Because there wasn't, you know, a lot of the privacy criticisms I presented to you, these are from, like, people mm-hmm. who care about data privacy. Of course, and, okay. and I care, too. Every day. I I'm squarely in the 6% that wasn't happy of the uh, way that digital fence is being communicated. Uh, there were 94% of approval. Uh, but the 6%, including probably the two people you have spoken to, uh, eventually worked with the member of a parliament uh, who set up a public hearing, essentially interpolation. Uh, and then the Department of Cybersecurity, the Minister of Justice, and so on, published for the first time, like how exactly this thing works uh, to the members of parliament, and also because it's live streamed, so to the public. Yeah, I don't know whether it's live streamed or recorded, but in any case, it's just published to the public afterwards. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, so like the 94%, right? But mm-hmm. most of the Island's residents actually mm-hmm. didn't care. And I mean, so much, you know, when I came here in quarantine and I was just like looking on Twitter and there were a lot mm-hmm. of people, people like to tweet when they're in quarantine. And there's so, <laughs> yeah, right. but there's a lot of people who are just all praise um, for, and, you know, no one thought about, no one, I, I think there was one critical article written by a Taiwanese American perhaps, mm-hmm. but where he was like kind of freaking out about the electronic fence. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I think his phone had shut off, so then the police like, called and... Um, yeah, I've read that article. He, okay, yeah, yeah, the BBC article. Yeah, we, we, we probably need to communicate it better. Um, but uh, I think the fact that there is no opting out uh, really is a different norm, right? Uh, of course, you can kind of opt out by saying, you know, I'm going to a hotel for a quarantine. I don't have a phone. Right. So, so that's a way of opting out, but it's kind of extreme. Uh, and also, uh, it doesn't really help um, the kind of legitimacy uh, of the government if we simply say that this works perfectly. Uh, no need to worry about it. The, the fact is that the digital fence, like the mask dispensing uh, system, um, is under a lot of co-creation uh, via the report of frontline people. The frontline health workers and the people in quarantine informed uh, the algorithm uh, a lot so that it started being quite imprecise but eventually became quite precise. Uh, for example, in, initially uh, in the quarantine places, some of the places didn't have good uh, like 4G cell phone tower reception. And so the signal would just float. And there's a lot of false alarms and so on. Uh, and of course, we, we just uh, install new equipment uh, around all the quarantine places and so on. And making sure that especially uh, like in near the Yami Mountain and things like that, we actually set up new 4G cell phone tower just so that uh, the signal will not uh, just float uh, all around. So it's a continuous improving process. And in the mask availability case, the map, uh, which is a great social innovation, definitely not a state innovation, um, conflicted with the pharmacist's uh, take-a-number system, which is, again, a social innovation. Uh, and so the pharmacists were handing out those numbers at the beginning of the day uh, in exchange of, of the national health card and then telling them to go back in the evening to collect the masks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what happened then is that the mask map will show that this pharmacy is full of availability. Mm-hmm. And only during lunch, when they're processing those IC cards, you'll just see this drop. Right, so but pe- this doesn't look natural. So people would accuse the pharmacists uh, of mm-hmm. just you know hoarding masks or something. So these two social innovations were initially at odds with each other, uh, but of course eventually uh, the next week actually after we rolled out the system, we set up the data schema so that the opening hours is divided into two uh, columns. One is for uh, the dispensing of the numbers, and one is for the dispensing of the mask. So that solves some of the problem. But still, some pharmacists tell me that even if they announce the take number uh, hours from 8, uh, maybe by 8.30, they already hand out all the numbers. So they still have this 30-minute window where people will call them saying, I see you have plenty of masks uh, on the map. Why are you saying you've all sold out? Mm-hmm. So they uh, wished for a button that they can click and disappear from the map, which I personally um, took that suggestion and worked with the NHIA to implement that button. And once that button gets implemented, they, they don't complain much anymore. And so <laughs> this is a co-creation process. And so if we started saying, you know, this is all perfect, uh, it's not like that. We all always say, yeah, sorry, we made some mistakes, and please uh, tell us so we can co-create. I, I brought up that case of the BBC article, not mm-hmm. uh, just to get your... Th- mm-hmm. I just wanted you to respond on that, mm-hmm. you know, whether 
it's true that most people in Asia do not care about their privacy. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think people do care about their privacy, and especially Taiwanese people. It's just that we have certain norms that were already there before the pandemic. Uh, and so as long as the counter-pandemic effort do not violate those norms, then these are tolerated. But I'm not saying that uh, these norms are very privacy preserving. For example, like handing out your ID card to park a car or something. That's actually compromised the privacy uh, because the current generation of ID cards uh, prints the name of both parents on the back of the card. Uh, and even the name of your spouse, if you have one. Oh, yeah. So people can easily, you know, figure out your sexual um, uh, orientation just by flipping <laughs> your uh, ID card <laughs> to, to the back. Uh, and, and that's, of course, a, a privacy encroaching norm, mm -hmm. and which we, we are fixing, which is the reason why I just handed out this card to you, <laughs> right? So, uh, so at the back of the card uh, of the seventh generation, there's no uh, name anymore. No uh, names of family members, spouses. Yeah, or spouses. Uh, it, it does say that this person is single, though. Okay. Um, this is my popular <laughs> demand. <right>? <laughs> <laughs> but at least no you know, sexual orientation discrimination <laughs> based on the name of the spouse. Okay. Um, and so we are working on improving those privacy norms. But the existing norms, some privacy preserving, some not, are what they are. And the most we can do during the fight of pandemic is not to make the norm even more uh, uh, dis destructive for privacy purposes. Mm. Okay, I mean, fair enough. And I, I ask these questions because I think, um, especially, you know, I, I'm American, mm -hmm. representing American media, and mm -hmm. we've all kind of seen how the pandemic mm -hmm. has. Well, I, I think in American English, so we have something. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's great. That, that, that makes my job so much easier. I don't want to translate. I know. I remember reading the Wired article and trying to remember, like, think of, like, do I have to research the Dalton Dalton Singh. Singh. Exactly, exactly. I've never read that. Um, but I, I asked this because I, I think a lot of societies, like the U.S. in particular, a democracy in name, um, has been struggling really... Um, you know, and a, and a lot of the struggle, I think, uh, especially if you look at the messaging around masks, right? People say, like, this violates my freedom um, if you tell me to wear a mask. Yeah, of course. And so we, we talked a little... Okay. That, that, that's why the Q spoke stock say, wear a mask to protect you against your own unwashed hands. Mm. Yeah. I guess the question is just, what are, what are, the, what are some of the lessons that... I know everyone's asked you this question, mm -hmm. but what, what are these? What are some of the lessons that can be taken away for democracy, mm -hmm. democratic nations, right? where you are balancing truly um, an increase mm -hmm. in? Uh, I'm only thinking of this in Chinese or something, right? Like increase in Chen Li, right? The, mm -hmm. uh, for in coercive power. Yeah, mm -hmm. for centralized mm -hmm. organizations like the CEC yeah, yeah, yeah. have a pandemic task. That's right. That's power. right. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you how are you balancing mm -hmm. that um, with mm -hmm. you know saving lives? Yeah, um, but by by substituting the coercive power to the social sector's communication power. Uh, there's this uh, well-established theory um, uh, by Manuel Castells, among others, uh, of uh, what is in the book called uh, The Communication Power. Uh, in, in it, um, the main uh, takeaway that I have uh, read the book uh, is um, the idea that the coercive power, top-down, or lockdown, or, I don't know, shutdown, takedown, whatever, <laughs> uh, these kind of powers, um, they are, of course, effective, but the uh, return is diminishing. And, and you can see this in action around the world. Uh, lockdown fatigue is it, a thing, mm -hmm. right? So even if you could theoretically uh, like get more coercive power mm -hmm. uh, by the design of something like CECC or in countries that didn't have a CECC by the emergency power during the crisis uh, that they can exercise to essentially bypass the parliament, um, you, you could, of course, constitutionally do that, but the return is diminishing because people get tired following the rules that they did not know why was there in the first place. And uh, on the other hand, if we focus on the communication power to make sure that Q spoke stock speaks in many languages, uh, explains that it is in your own best individual interest, even if you have you know, uh, no one nearby, it's still possible that you would touch a surface that has the virus on it. 
it's still possible that you would just, you know, um, like literally uh, put your hand to your mouth. Um, and in Mandarin, is a thing, right? So, um, so if you do that, you still get infected, even with, with nobody nearby. So a mask is not about protecting other people. It's about protecting yourself against your own hand. Uh, and that links mask use to hand sanitation. And so that message isn't a top-down message. Uh, and everyone who hear this message can remind each other in whatever way they deem um, reasonable. And so, in fact, if you ask people uh, around February, why are you wearing a mask? Many of them would tell you that they wear a mask even when CECC tells it's okay to not wear a mask on metros, uh, which they did for a couple of days, uh, fearing a mask shortage. And then we, we very quickly changed course, did a U-turn and say, you have to wear a mask after all. Uh, yeah, but, but those 48 hours, um, people still wore a mask because they understood the importance of it and actually... Uh, criticize the ECC for, for, for saying that. So fortunately, it's just 48 hours and not, say, 48 days. But, <laughs> yes. Right. So the message then was they were thinking about saving themselves. Exactly. Right. Then, I guess, do you, when you look at the U.S., do you, do you think there was just kind of a science communication failure? In summer. I don't know. I mean, by Taiwanese standards, when at the time of the pandemic, when our top uh, epidemiologic um, authority want to talk to the vice president, he, he just look into the mirror, right? So, <laughs> like, literally, VP Chen Jian is the author on epidemiology textbook uh, and also uh, led uh, the SARS 1.0 uh, counter SARS. Um, effort. Uh, and so, so by that standard, I mean, it's not a reasonable standard <laughs> to, to, to expect uh, other jurisdictions. And also, um, I think it's also because we had a societal inoculation uh, thanks to the 2003 SARS 1.0 um, um, bad experience about lockdown and all that, panic buying in 95, the central government saying completely different thing from the municipal government. So, so we had it quite bad in 2003. So we know what, uh, say, the U.S. is going through because it's not unlike what Taiwan went through in 2003. And so we learned from it in 2004, uh, did this cross all the three branches, uh, joint work, designing the CDC thing. Um, and so I think, yeah, the, assuming that, of course, the vaccines work, um, I think all the democratic countries will probably do what we did in 2004, uh, which is to set up uh, new rules and designs and mechanisms and so on, so that people will not panic when SARS 3.0 came. And it will. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, can we talk a bit m about, um, you've, you've talked a lot about open governance, you've talked a lot about using digital tools to kind of um, build up democracy mm -hmm, and trust, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you sent a Twitter message to mm -hmm. uh, Joe Biden and oh, yeah. Kamala Harris yeah. recently mm -hmm. saying yes. that, what did you say exactly? He um, said, come and visit. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. We can the share trust, the Taiwan model. Trust of the government mm -hmm. right, is very important and that trust of the trust of the citizens is also very the government trusting citizens is very important, yes. Um, what, I mean, are, are there any lessons that you think Taiwan can offer in terms of trust mm -hmm, um, sure. between the citizens <clears throat> and government um, mm -hmm. to a lot of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I ask this also because I think in the current environment, um, the internet has become this place that it's... It's very different from its original vision, right? Originally, the, uh, the vision of the internet is this... Place where you could share knowledge. It's to, to survive a nuclear holocaust. Oh, yeah, was that? That was the original design. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe and then the utopian. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, but the utopian vision of the internet that I think was uh, yeah. quite there in the early sure. 2000s. Sure. If we're talking about uh, sharing, yeah. meeting friends, making connections. Mm -hmm. uh, but these days the internet is filled with disinformation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably leading to more polarization sure. as opposed to less. So yeah. just, and we saw that really with the U.S. election mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. this time. There's so much disinformation. So I, I guess what lessons, what tools, what mm -hmm. can they use? Mm -hmm. What are some, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some solutions. Yeah, I think there's um, a couple of things, like literally two things. Uh, one is about the government trusting citizens. So we use this approach that we call <clears throat> people-public-private partnership, 
um, which is not unlike um, the slogans other jurisdictions use, but we put people first. That is to say, the social sector come up with the norm. For example, during election campaigns, it's essential for the campaign donation expenditure to be published not only as information, but as open data, so that investigative journalists can work with data scientists uh, to develop uh, models that will then find out the link uh, between uh, the vested interest and uh, people who campaign, for example. Um, and publishing as PDF files makes their life harder, right? Uh, and publishing as just paper copies makes it even harder. So people in the Gap Zero uh, movement did this uh, interesting uh, intervention where they uh, went um, straight to the control yuan, the jian cha yuan, uh, and took out those uh, A4 photocopied um, campaign donation records and expenditure records and um, scanned them and uh, published it for everybody to do a CAPTCHA style uh, OCR so that people can collectively uh, rebuild the structural data that was hoarded uh, by the control yuan. And, and that went so successful. That is, the control yuan said, you know, even if each uh, number have three people looking at it, you can't be sure it's 100%. True. So you're, you're probably publishing some misinformed information. And so the response from the Gap Zero movement is that, yeah, which is why you should publish the structural data uh, as a, um, your duty. Um, <clears throat> I, I also participate in drafting that response. But anyway, so um, at the end, end of the day, the control and, and the legislature agreed on it. So um, by 2018 election, that's the first time that Control Yuan actually published the structural open data for campaign donation expenditure. And then we have a new social norm set by the social sector, no less. So it's a people-public partnership now. And then we talk to Facebook saying, look, there's a norm. You can either you know, refrain from publishing your uh, ads library uh, or you publish in a very obscure way uh, but in which case, uh, people will see and say that um, a lot of campaigns evaded this uh, radical transparency by uh, telling their supporters to buy them Facebook advertisements, bypassing the radical transparency here. Uh, and so you may face uh, social sanction if you keep doing this. Uh, and, and I told Facebook that very clearly. Um, and so even if we don't have true jurisdiction over Facebook, social sanction in, in Taiwan is a very strong um, thing. Uh, and so Facebook eventually worked, uh, I think uh, Taiwan is among the first jurisdiction, if not the first, uh, where they just published like everything uh, in the S library as open data and banned foreign people from buying advertisements during our presidential election uh, this year. Uh, and so this is a negotiation with the mandate from the social sector and the public sector, and eventually with the um, <clears throat> agreement, um, reluctant or not, by the private sector uh, of this new norm. So this is the first thing about trusting the social sector to people to set a norm and then work with the business sector only after the social sector and the public sector reached the consensus uh, and then can pressure the private sector together. So this is the, the first lesson uh, I would like to share. Yeah. The, the second one is uh, working with journalists, not against journalists. <laughs> uh, and um, in, in Taiwan, uh, news, Xin Wen, literally is the same word as journalism, Xin Wen Ye or Xin Wen Gong Su. Mm -hmm. right? So journalism is literally just news work and journalists, mm -hmm. news workers. Mm -hmm. So there's no way in Taiwan to say the F word, fake news, uh, without offending journalists. Because if you say Jia Xin Wen, it mm -hmm. sounds like you're accusing journalists uh, of not doing their job uh, correctly. Right. It has the same sting in English. Oh, really? I say that. <laughs> I uh, it's, it's two different words in English. And, but people will... <laughs> People would just lobby that at uh -huh. you in interviews these days. Uh -huh. Oh, really? Oh, you're fake news. Like, okay. it's been happening okay. since Trump became president. I see, I see. Okay. That was to me. Okay, that's, that's cool. news to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and both my parents are journalists. So, oh. so out of filial piety, a <laughs> Confucian concept, uh, I can't say the F word. I, I can't say just in one. Uh, and so uh, in Taiwan, we say jia xun xi wei hai, right? The, the disinformation crisis. Uh, and disinformation has a legal definition as intentional untruths that cause public harm. Uh, if it only harms, say, the image of a minister, 
it's just good journalism. <laughs> so, so, right? so it has to cause public harm for, for it to be uh, classified as disinformation. Uh, and so I think I have a clear delineation between journalistic work that is sometimes mistaken. Journalists, like everyone, makes mistakes, uh, but versus the intentional untruths that cause public harm. This part, uh, the journalistic part, we need to democratize it and make sure that in the K-12 curriculum, for example, the students can become kind of part-time fact-checkers and uh, like essentially participate in fact-checking the presidential candidates uh, that actually happened during this election. Uh, and uh, that, uh, together, is a much stronger counter uh, point to this uh, intentional disinformation. Now, if you classify like the journalists doing their honest work, along with the people who uh, intentionally spread uh, information operations and things like that, then you lose the most important ally you have, which is the journalistic norm. Uh, and, then, and then you might as well start calling journalists uh, like text um, workers or text collectors or the editors, uh, text processors, workers. content workers, right? Which is devoid of the meaning because um, it's just like uh, when you call um, journalists as just content producers and so on, uh, it uh, removes the journalistic norm and ethics and standard that defines journalism. But that is actually the safeguard of the community against uh, this information. So, um, Reinforcing that, that journalistic standard, making sure that everybody can be an amateur uh, journalist and, and participate in journalistic ethics and norms, and also in the schools, teach not media literacy, but media competence for, for a lot of those children or maybe have more Instagram followers than I do. So in a sense, they are media, and so be a competent media and adhere to the journalistic standards. I think this is, again, very important, and really the reason why, uh, like even though we do have our own share of disinformation during our presidential election. There was a uh, trending rumor that says the CIA printed invisible ink uh, so that no matter who votes, uh, your ink would disappear and President Tsai will get a, a, a vote. Um, and that get dispelled because people were encouraged to participate uh, in media competence and during our counting process, like people who are literally YouTubers can be there and film the counting process uh, and use their own apps. Uh, it could be called or or whatever to do the counting themselves in a decentralized fashion. And, and that means that even though the disinformation did spread for a few hours, um, this, uh, like YouTubers in all the different political affiliations, uh, confirmed jointly that the counting process was indeed free and fair. Um. Speaking of the misinformation, the media literacy mm -hmm. uh, education, I, uh, in mm -hmm. thinking your last interview with AP, you talked mm -hmm. about trying to bring that into the education. Yeah, media competence. Yes, yeah. We, we now have a, uh, I think it's at mlearn, uh, is a website okay. um, that we are now sharing this curriculum of not just K-12, to but lifelong education as well. Okay. And so that's a public resource that teachers can yes. access. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and to go back to the Facebook point, Sorry, I know we're mm. going over time. Sure, it's fine. Um, let me know if you need to run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but maybe five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did that did that work? Um, was, mm -hmm. Do you feel like Facebook publishing that data, mm -hmm. um, the ads data, mm -hmm. um, and I guess limiting also foreign. Uh, mm -hmm. foreign buyers, mm -hmm. um, do you feel like that had an impact? It, it did, because if any candidate tried a dark pattern, it would get discovered and made into sensational reporting. <laughs> so, which is why during the presidential election, I don't think anyone in the legislation or the uh, presidential race tried any dark patterns uh, on Facebook. But they might have tried through other other channels. But on the other hand, of course, Facebook was the, the dominant channel during that election. Uh, and so Facebook's participation means a lot. But of course, the same accord that Facebook agreed on is also agreed by Line and also by, um, I think, Yahoo uh, and also Google slash YouTube. So, so it's a pretty good roundup. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, I guess we'll, just one final question about disinformation, which is, that's kind of also a question of volume, right? Um, because if 
Taiwan's supposedly the source of the most disinformation. Like, you're, you guys are the target of the most disinformation. Probably not source. <laughs> right, you guys are not source, sorry. Okay. No, I misspoke. Um, there's some paper from uh -huh. the Institute yeah. in Sweden or something. I've read that. Right, right. That, uh -huh. Because of China. It's a qualitative survey, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, t Taiwan has a. Uh, I've heard of COFAX. I know you guys have mm -hmm. multiple like fact checking centers. Mm -hmm. Michael Penn, Taiwan Fact Check Center, and so on. Even Trend Micro and okay. Who's Call uh, yeah. all, all offer their services. Yeah, I guess the question is though. I mean, are they just kind of drops in the bucket fighting against this volume of you know? There's a lot of money being poured mm -hmm. into disinformation, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. also I feel like sometimes you, the fact um, listening to these facts, listening to using things like a line bot to mm -hmm. check a fact requires a certain degree of tech savviness that may not be present in the populations that are actually getting, mm -hmm. so like older people. Yeah, which is why Q spoke stock posters are also very effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like preventative uh, medicine, like mm -hmm. vaccine of the mind. Yeah, yeah I guess I, I, I just, uh, I wonder if the government has any thoughts about volume, if you have any thoughts about just volume and combating the sheer volume. But, but not all uh, of those voluminous uh, disinformation um, actually turns viral. But if the R value is under one, meaning that each person on average doesn't share it to at least one other person, we don't even need to counter that. Mm -hmm. right? It's the same as epidemiology. Mm. Right, you, you only work on the sort of virus that has a R value above one, yeah, and and that is actually quite few. Okay. Huh. Okay. I guess that's called that's why it's called going viral. Uh huh. Uh, great. I don't think I have. Yeah, I don't think I have any more questions. Okay. Awesome. Um. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add? Um. Well, I, I think. Um, uh, the, the American experiment, the great American experiment, um, is about um, just publicly tackling those structural issues that affect democracy uh, and sharing the experience of how to tackle it uh, with the entire world. Uh, that's what I said uh, during my uh, interview with, uh, I think, Tyler Cohen. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's my message. <laughs> uh, and Taiwan uh, is following in, in that idea, in that, of course, we face a lot of um, threats, as you put it. Um, but uh, our way of countering, say, the disinformation without a takedown, or our way of countering the pandemic without, say, a lockdown, uh, I think is of broad um, applicability to um, democracies, um, whether social democracies or liberal democracies, uh, worldwide for um, I think uh, at the end of the day, a democratic system is self-healing, is resilient, uh, and each uh, onslaught of whether the virus of the mind or the virus of the body uh, strengthens the democracy and produce like novel antibodies to, to overextend the metaphor, uh, which may be shared yeah, in a kind of COVAX arrangement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good. That's a good ending metaphor. Um, okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Cheers.